Welcome. Thanks for coming. Today's panel examines a topic that the Obama administration <clears throat> will surely struggle with in the coming year and beyond, the complex relationship between political reform and security in the Middle East and wider Muslim world. As we well know, in the wake of 9-11, democracy promotion became a matter of high foreign policy making. The guiding assumption behind this shift was that the absence of democracy, or more precisely, the presence of autocracy, is a root cause, cause of Islamist extremism, movements, and ideologies. Repudiating, at least in word, decades of support for Arab autocrats Washington declared that it would henceforth back a process of political reform that would not only help repair the torn fabric of Arab and Muslim political systems, but also provide, in the long run at least, it was hoped, a more durable basis for domestic political stability and regional peacemaking and security. This vision was hardly applied in a consistent fashion, particularly in states of strategic importance to the United States, such as Egypt or Pakistan. Moreover, it was largely untested, and truth be told, it was not very well thought out. Yet it did create this vision in both the Middle East and the United States, expectations that given the nature and complexities of the challenge itself, expectations that were bound in some sense to be dashed or at least frustrated. Thus, perhaps the inevitable crash when in the wake of electoral successes by Islamist groups in Egypt and Palestine, and in the face of mounting sectarian conflict in Iraq, critics of the freedom agenda within and outside the U.S. government, quietly or not quietly, began to sound warnings of a, quote, democratic backlash. That term, democratic backlash, of course, has a double meaning. Analytically, it pointed to the supposed boomerang effect of political reform in the Middle East, reform that was assumed empowering Islamist forces and creating instability. And prescriptively, the term democratic backlash made the case, in effect, for backing away from democracy promotion in favor of a foreign policy guided first and foremost by realpolitik considerations. Viewing these developments, in winter 2008, USIP organized a study group on reform and security in the Muslim world, chaired by Larry Diamond and Frank Fukuyama, directed by myself, and made up of leading scholars, policy makers, and practitioners. The study group has met regularly to consider and debate the track record of reform since 2003, on the one hand, and the impact of political reforms on the domestic political stability of key Muslim states on the other. We've also reversed the formula, the formula looking at the relationship or effort to promote security and its effect on reform. Ultimately, the mission of the study group is to provide concrete policy relevant recommendations for designing democratic reform strategies that can enhance domestic political stability and regional stability and thus reduce the potential tensions or trade-offs between the quest for democracy and the exigencies of domestic and regional security. While the study group will continue its work into 2009 and is continuing its work, we thought it would be useful to share with you today some of the broad as well as case-specific findings. <clears throat> For this purpose, we are joined by three members of the study group. Uh, immediately to my left, Mona Yakubian, to her left, Samer Shahata, and to my right, Shuja Nawaz. Now, before each of these speakers, and we'll start with Samer this afternoon, discusses the particular cases. Samer will discuss Egypt, Mona will discuss Lebanon, and Shuja will dive into the easy case of Pakistan. I wanted to share three broad findings for our, from our deliberations, and I want to make clear that these are sort of broad findings because we are far from completing our work, and we are still uh, deliberating and debating, and we'll continue to do so into the spring particularly as the study group begins to focus more on the cases of South Asia more intensively. First of all, all of the study group members believe that an uncritical jump from the neo-Wilsonianism of the past years to an equally uncritical revamped realism will ultimately undermine U.S. security interests. While democratic reforms by their very nature introduce a level of uncertainty and sometimes instability that troubles regimes, 
and the key constituencies that they protect, the ideological and political gulf between states and societies will only expand absent a process of gradual political reforms that allow for accountability, participation, and effective governance. To put it succinctly, we do not believe that it would be in the interest of the United States simply to abandon this agenda, and we are concerned about how it can be revived in a more effective way to garner both domestic political support, or support in the Beltway in particular, and of course regional support uh, where the reform agenda is unfolding. Second, we believe that Washington must give greater attention to the overall architecture of security and peacemaking in the Middle East. The cases of Jordan and even Palestine demonstrate that where there is a real prospect for a just and sustainable two-state solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, radical Islamist voices will mobilize, but they will not necessarily prevail. Indeed, Hamas's so-called electoral victory was not the result of an inevitable Islamist wave spreading throughout the region. Had the peace process borne fruits much earlier, and had Fatah not fragmented in tandem with the, coll the collapse of the peace process, it is doubtful that Hamas would have squeezed through in 2005. Third, we believe that a resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict will reinforce modern Arab voices and in so doing allow for a more sustained focus on the domestic challenges of political reform. There is a linkage there, particularly the closer you get to the center of this conflict. But we do not think that Washington should throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater by pursuing a peace process at the expense of democratization. Arab leaders will happily invoke the challenge of Arab-Israeli peacemaking or, of course, the struggle against radical Islam to deflect pressures for reform. But as the case of Pakistan suggests, and it's not the only case, Washington should not indulge such posturing, such instrumental posturing, in a manner that magnifies the political leverage of increasingly unpopular autocrats. None of our friends in the Middle East or South Asia will abandon their strategic relationship with a U.S. government that makes clear its long-term commitment in both word and deed to a process of effective political reforms. So we do believe that the United States needs to be recommitted to this agenda, but committed in a way that uh, will produce a uh, effective and gradual uh, process of democratization. Now, having said all that, these are three broad outlines. The cases are very different in many respects. They share some similarities. Uh, we couldn't possibly, in the context of this meeting today, in the short hour that we have, uh, provide you a summary of all our deliberations or go into all the cases, obviously. But we thought we would at least share with you uh, some of the uh, 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 particular case studies. Uh, all a key group of, uh, within the core group of our study group, we're tasked with the challenge of looking at the relationship between domestic political stability and domestic security and regional security since 2003 or 2004, looking empirically at the record, looking at the potential trade-offs and tensions between security and reform, and also looking in particular at the way regimes instrumentalize the question of security in ways that are designed to fend off the challenge of reform. So the, our members were tasked to produce papers. What you're going to hear today is not a recapitulation of those papers, but in some sense an expansion of some of the ideas in those papers and some of the conclusions that they suggest. And we're going to start with Samer. And we'll, each of our members will speak from 12, no more than 15 minutes. I promise to be ruthless. They've been pre-warned several times. So we will leave enough time. It's not easy to do that with your colleagues and friends. Uh, but uh, we will try to leave enough time for questions uh, at the end of the three presentations. So Samer, please. Sure. Thank you, Dan. Just to um, add something to Dan's comments, I think uh, I speak for the group if I were to add that uh, we share the belief that issues of reform should be pursued and continue to be pursued peacefully, non-militarily, of course, and in a consistent manner throughout the region. I, I'd like to thank Dan Brumberg and the U.S. Institute of Peace for inviting me to participate in, in this event and address this audience. It is, of course, impossible to do justice to our long papers in 12 minutes. And as a result, much will be omitted in my presentation. Some things will be simplified and other points will be presented telegraphically. Because of time constraints, I will concentrate on the conclusion, lessons and policy recommendations, and if there is time in the Q&A, I can discuss other sections of the report. 
Okay, moving to the major lessons and policy recommendations with regard to the case of Egypt, which I work on every day of my life. Uh, I have eight. The first is, credible and consistent rhetoric coupled with action are effective and inexpensive with regard to promoting reform. <coughs> U.S. pressure on the Egyptian government between 2003 and 2005 played an important role in facilitating Cairo's political opening in 2005. Consistent rhetoric from the President and the Secretary of State, followed up with diplomatic action, provided a disincentive for the Egyptian government to crack down on peaceful political activity, protest, and other forms of political dissent. Although U.S. pressure did not achieve democracy, nor could it, or even substantive political reform in this case, it helped expand the space in which domestic actors could operate. An American focus on reform and high-level statements provided cover and restrained regime repression. Domestic actors, including new movements, reform-minded judges, and established political groups, took advantage of the increased space to engage in peaceful politics. When U.S. pressure was reduced at the end of 2005, during Egypt's parliamentary elections, as Muslim Brotherhood candidates won an unprecedented 88 out of 444 elected seats in parliament, the Cairo Spring rapidly turned to winter. The Egyptian government quickly moved toward political deliberalization. And of course, two other historical events should be quickly added to understand this, and that is the following months, that is January 26, 2006, the victory of Hamas in legislative uh, elections in Palestine, followed by the summer 2006 war between Hezbollah and uh, Israel, which <coughs> transformed Hassan Nasrallah into the hero of the Arab world and, of course, made President Mubarak and that regime look significantly better from the perspective of Washington among some. The second conclusion concerns security, or understood in a different way, the stability of the Egyptian government with regard to these efforts. At no time as a result of U.S. pressure for reform on the Egyptian government was the stability of the Mubarak regime seriously threatened. Legal political parties in Egypt are feeble, other organized political forces are weak, and the Muslim Brotherhood, and this is very important, the leading opposition movement in the country does not have the organizational capacity, the ideological inclination, or the political interest in coming to power through force. Although the Brotherhood retains some troubling ideological elements in tension with democratic principles, and I'd be happy to speak about that if you'd like, it has consistently demonstrated a commitment to peaceful political participation for at least three decades and in the face of significant regime repression. Therefore, and in conjunction with the following points I'm going to make, the incoming administration should not refrain from encouraging Cairo to move forward on political reform issues. <coughs> Third lesson relates to the cost of pursuing reform for the United States. The cost of U.S. pressure for reform with regard to, the, to Egyptian cooperation on key U.S. interests has been limited and mostly rhetorical. Although this is in need of some further investigation, the evidence suggests that even during the period when U.S. pressure for reform was greatest, there was continued Egyptian assistance on key issues deemed critical to U.S. policy in the region, namely Israeli-Palestinian negotiations and the peace process, support for the new Iraq government, including establishing diplomatic relations between Cairo and Baghdad, and Egyptian training for the Iraqi police force, and support for curbing Iran's influence in the region. Moreover, during this period, the U.S. continued to routinely enjoy overflight rights above Egyptian territory, and hundreds of U.S. military vessels, including nuclear vessels, continued to be granted expedited passage through the Suez Canal. Egypt also maintained its cooperation with the U.S. in what the Bush administration has dubbed, quote, the global war on terrorism, unquote. Feathers were ruffled, and Egyptian officials, including President Mubarak and many other Arab leaders, criticized U.S. reform efforts as, quote, foreign ideas imposed from the outside, unquote. But this does not appear to have manifested itself in consequential action on the part of Cairo. In order to understand this, it should be quickly noted that Egypt has a self-interest in Palestinian-Israeli peace, uh, independent of U.S. policy concerns in the region. In fact, this morning, David Makovsky said that it is not about doing anyone a favor, that quote, unquote, that Egypt pursues uh, uh, peaceful relations in the region, and particularly with regard to the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is a sensitive domestic political issue as well as a legitimate national security concern for Cairo. Moreover, as a regional power, Egypt has an interest in curbing Iranian influence in the Middle East. Such policies on the part of the Egyptian government would likely be pursued in one form or another, whether the U.S. exerted pressure or encouraged reform on the Egyptian government or not. 
The fourth point has to do with pursuing both peace and reform simultaneously, and Dan mentioned this in the initial comments. There is no reason, with regard to my examination of the Egyptian case, why U.S. policy cannot pursue Palestinian-Israeli peace and support reform and democratization in Egypt and the wider region simultaneously. I am certainly not underemphasizing the importance of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict for Middle Eastern politics, but there is no evidence or inherent logic that points to the necessity of pursuing one of these objectives at the expense of the other. Nor is there evidence to suggest that one policy concern, a focus on the peace process, for example, must necessarily precede the other. Of course, it would be extremely difficult to effectively pursue almost any U.S. objective in the region under the conditions of the last two weeks. But both peace and reform can and should be pursued simultaneously, consistently, and even-handedly. In fact, being actively engaged, let alone making progress on the Palestinian-Israeli issue, as well as Iraq and a number of other issues, will limit Arab regimes from using these issues to create anti-U.S. sentiment and excuses to reject political reform. The fifth point regards America's standing in the region. It is no secret that U.S. policies over the last eight years have significantly damaged America's standing in the Middle East. Expectations on the incoming administration are extremely high, and this is especially true in the region. Securing a just and lasting Arab-Israeli peace, in addition to a stable and independent Iraq and closing the Guantanamo Bay prison camp, as well as other things, would certainly improve public opinion toward the U.S. There are also expectations among many in the region that the new U.S. administration will more effectively, consistently, and credibly pursue laudable U.S. principles of human rights, rule of law, and democracy. America's standing in the Middle East will be impacted by whether these principles are reflected by U.S. foreign policy. President-elect Obama understands this and has criticized what he has called an ineffective, quote, 20th century mindset of supporting dictators as long as they are our dictators, end quote. The sixth point. Back principles and don't back people. The U.S. must support principles and not individuals in its push for reform. While the U.S. should not stop applying pressure on Egypt and other countries in cases such as Ayman Noor's or Saadeddin Ibrahim's, for example, for U.S. commitments to rule of law, fairness, and democracy to be taken seriously and be more effective, the U.S. must support the principles of rule of law, due process, and free speech regardless of who the victims of political oppression are, and not just when the victims happen to support Washington. The seventh point regards supporting reforms that already enjoy broad public domestic support in the region and in the particular countries. Rather than pursuing a Washington-centric reform agenda, the U.S. should support proposals that already enjoy widespread domestic appeal. For example, broad segments, overwhelmingly in Egypt, support lifting restrictions on forming political parties, for example, abolishing military trials for civilians, establishing presidential term limits, lifting the emergency law, providing civil society groups greater freedom, supporting judicial reform proposed by Egypt's pro-democracy judges, in addition to things like ending torture. These are basic democratic principles that deserve our support. Finally, don't pick winners during Egypt's succession. Egypt will, of course, undergo a presidential transition in the coming period. The U.S. should not be seen as supporting particular individuals for the Egyptian presidency. Many in Egypt already believe that the U.S. supports a father-to-son succession, and they have good reason to think so. Doing so, however, would be both dangerous for the United States and inappropriate. The transition will present its own challenges and opportunities, and I'm speaking about the transition in Cairo for the moment, and the U.S. should be prepared to use this moment to encourage structural political reforms such as those mentioned above. There are many more issues to discuss than the 12 minutes have allowed, or 11 minutes I think I might have taken, and I would be happy to address some of them in the question and answer period. Let me end, however, by saying that Egyptians are increasingly frustrated with political stagnation, corruption, poor governance, rising prices, and for many, deteriorating economic conditions. U.S. policies that support comprehensive peace in the region, democratization, and economic prosperity are in our interests as well as the people in the region. Thank you very much. Political reform and domestic security, in my case, in the Lebanese case. Uh, and then I will conclude with my sort of policy recommendations. Let me give my bottom line up front. While it may appear that domestic security and reform are mutually exclusive goals, I would argue that these are, in fact, complementary and mutually reinforcing. You cannot achieve one without the other. Uh, let me unpack this a little bit in the Lebanese case. I think at first glance, 
the trade-offs between political reform and domestic security in Lebanon appear significant. Certainly, in the short term, clear tensions exist. I don't want to reduce my answer to a commentary on Hezbollah. Um, I think Lebanon's complexities deserve far more than that, and yet Hezbollah is the elephant in the room. So let me dive right in and address it up front. Um, Lebanon is slated to hold parliamentary elections on June, th June the 7th, and the militant Shiite organization is expected to fare quite well. As part of a broader coalition, they are likely to win a mandate to form a unity government. The inherent contradiction of an armed militia winning free and transparent elections is obvious. And in some cases, one may see or hear echoes of the Palestinian elections in 2006, uh, in which Hamas did quite well. Moreover, Hezbollah's democratic tendencies and its commitment to political reform are certainly suspect. Uh, Hezbollah has also benefited tremendously from Lebanon's weak central government and does not appear to have any genuine interest in strengthening state institutions. Meanwhile, many Lebanese take great issue with Hezbollah's reckless decision making, taking Lebanon into a war with Israel in the summer of 2006 and then turning its arms on its fellow Lebanese this past May. And of course, Hezbollah maintains its arms in violation of UN resolutions 1559 and 1701, obviously a key point of contention. And yet, Hezbollah, with its deeply entrenched grassroots support, is widely recognized as the most credible and legitimate representative of Lebanon's Shiite community, a community that many believe constitutes a plurality in Lebanon's volatile confessional mix. Here, I think, it is important to consider Hezbollah's dual nature as both an armed resist a mil militia qua resistance movement and a social and political movement that is deeply rooted in the Shiite community. Hezbollah is viewed as both clean, that is to say devoid of corruption, and competent, providing important social services in the face of an often ineffective Lebanese state. It is, in effect, the most powerful representative of Lebanon's largest community. As such, Hezbollah cannot simply be ignored, ostracized, or replaced. Um, let me take a step back for a moment and provide a little bit of historic background, which is unique to Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon is a country that has been governed by a system of proportional representation based on the confessional breakdown of its 18 recognized sects. Power is currently distributed using a parity ratio, essentially divided equally between Muslims and Christians. Unfortunately, Lebanon's power sharing agreements, first in the 1943 National Pact and later with the 1989 Ta'if Accord, have not always reflected dynamic shifts in the population. So far, attempts to recalculate Lebanon's power sharing formula have largely been achieved excuse me, through violence. Most notably with the 1975 to 1990 civil war. Um, since Ta'if, the Shiite community in Lebanon appears to be on the ascendance. Certainly since the Israeli withdrawal in 2000 and the Syrian withdrawal in 2005. Indeed, it suggests that te the tectonic plates in Lebanon are shifting, reflecting a new demographic and political reality. As with other eras in Lebanese history, there are two ways to address this shift, through negotiation or through violence. The current national dialogue and the upcoming elections hold the potential for beginning to address these issues peacefully and, if accompanied by appropriate reforms, could put Lebanon on the path to peace and stability. As such, the key question is, how to integrate Hezbollah politically and turn it away from its resistance mode toward being a fully vested political player. How to integrate its armed faction into the Lebanese national security apparatus. Certainly this is not a transformation that can occur overnight. And yet the answer to this complex question underscores the long-term reality that political reform and domestic security in Lebanon are not contradictory forces. Rather, they are complementary goals that can reinforce one another. 
It is only through sustained political reform and institution building that necessarily addresses and deconflicts the aspirations and grievances of all of Lebanon's communities that long-term domestic security and stability can be established. Policies bent on disenfranchising or quashing any one community, be it Christian, Sunni, Shia, or Druze, will ensure the continuation of violence and instability. So let me move very quickly to my policy recommendations. And here again, let me underscore that we're talking about an endeavor that is long-term in nature. Essentially, I would call for nothing short of a paradigm shift vis-a-vis -vis U.S. policy in Lebanon. Following the euphoria of Lebanon's 2005 CETA revolution, U.S. policy fell far short of helping the Lebanese to build on that momentous achievement. The U.S. pursued a policy that essentially sought to promote one faction over another rather than helping to lay the groundwork for a peaceful and democratic Lebanon. After months of political paralysis and violence, Lebanon came to the precipice of civil war last May. The U.S. needs to move away from policies based on promoting particular factions within Lebanon's fractious political arena and instead seek to build a consensus for reform and reconciliation among all Lebanese parties. I would advocate five specific recommendations. First, I believe we need to develop a more nuanced understanding of Hezbollah. Well-crafted policy originates from nuanced and accurate analysis. I would make a plea for attempting to seek to understand better Hezbollah as a movement. More work needs to be done in order to arrive at a judgment on the nature of Hezbollah, its intentions, and its long-term objectives. Under what conditions might Hezbollah evolve into a fully political actor and integrate its arms? How would the environment need to change? To what extent can U.S. policies and actions in Lebanon encourage this shift? <clears throat> Second, to play a constructive role in Lebanon, the U.S. must recognize Lebanon's political and demographic realities. We should resist the temptation to play regional proxy wars out on Lebanese soil. Certainly, no one can deny that Iran's influence and Syria's on Hezbollah is important, but Hezbollah cannot be reduced to an Iranian proxy. Hezbollah is also a Lebanese player that represents a key community. The U.S. must address Lebanon's evolving confessional makeup. Third, U.S. policy in Lebanon should be above the fray. Uh, US, the U.S. policy, as I mentioned, of supporting one side over another has not yielded intended, the intended results. Instead, Lebanon has witnessed great instability and violence since 2005. More broadly, whenever U.S. policy in Lebanon is geared toward supporting one faction or another, the U.S. has not been successful in achieving its goals. Rather, it ends up getting sucked into the morass of Lebanese politics. Fourth, U.S. efforts should be focused on institution building, strengthening the state, and political reconciliation through dialogue. The U.S. should specifically seek to strengthen state institutions such as the parliament, armed forces, the judiciary, Last year, as part of the Doha Accord, a new electoral law was passed. It achieved some important reforms, but more significant reform is necessary to help move Lebanon from a system of feudal politics to a modern democracy. Ultimately, Lebanon will need to move away from its confessional system. The roadmap for this shift is laid out in the Ta'if Accord, and the U.S. should seek to promote reforms that place Lebanon squarely on this path. Finally, I would advocate that we engage with Syria. The U.S. needs to adopt a policy of engagement with Syria for several reasons, among them the promotion of stability in Lebanon. Ultimately, Syria's longstanding in in interests in Lebanon have to be acknowledged. But let me be very clear, this recognition does not translate into a ceding of Lebanese sovereignty. Specifically, the U.S. should encourage the continuation of the normalization of ties between Syria and Lebanon. Uh, the Syrians opened their embassy in Beirut this past week. The next more important, perhaps more difficult step will be the demarcation of borders and addressing the numerous bilateral treaties governing relations that were signed during the period of Syrian hegemony in Lebanon. Taken together, I would advocate that these five steps may help to reconcile the apparent contradictions 
between security and reform and place Lebanon on a path toward peace and stability. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's a pleasure being here and uh, seeing so many familiar faces. Uh, I hope uh, I don't end up repeating things that you've already heard me say, including uh, yesterday. Um, but uh, I was brought into this study um, uh, once it, has been, it had been launched because uh, Larry Diamond and Frank uh, Fukuyama decided that uh, the Islamic world really needed to encompass Pakistan as well. And so a new definition emerged. And I was pleased uh, because uh, as I participated in the group, I discovered what I'm discovering even now, listening to my two colleagues here, that many of the lessons that uh, can be drawn from the region, particularly for US policy, uh, are quite common and similar. Uh, and so uh, my attempt uh, in, as part of this study was uh, to address the question, is history going to repeat itself? And this was couched in terms of the US-Pakistan uh, relationship. Uh, but <clears throat> when we look at security and reform, um, as Dan also emphasized, the issue is not simply external relationships. Uh, it, the, the real key to, to uh, long-term security are internal issues and what countries are willing to do themselves and what the United States is willing to help countries uh, achieve over the long run. Uh, so there needs to be, uh, if I were to, t uh, to cite my bottom line up front, uh, there needs to be a shift uh, of the United States from a transactional relationship to a strategic long-term relationship. And just to give you a very quick potted history of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, um, because uh, obviously these details are, are far too long uh, to compress in such a short period, but uh, it's akin to a roller coaster uh, with its ups and downs. And uh, there are periods of intense friendship um, or ostensible friendship, uh, which are primarily guided by the United States' uh, uh, own strategic interests and, and not taking into account uh, what Pakistan's strategic interests are. Uh, and these be begin in the early 1950s, in 1954, uh, with, a, with a defense pact. Uh, which was basically designed to help uh, the United States uh, protect uh, the oil fields of Iran and Iraq against any uh, Soviet uh, uh, advances towards the south. Uh, well, that didn't last very long because uh, Pakistan's interest was not so much as fighting the communists as it was to fight India. And so the Pakistanis took advantage of US aid and largesse and basically uh, doubled and tripled their army over time. Uh, and most of the, the new cantonments uh, or military reservations that they built were facing the Indian border. But the US went along <coughs> with that. So this was a, a relationship between willing adults. And uh, uh, it was uh, also described by one US diplomat as an elaborate hoax. Um, then you had the 1958 coup, uh, under which uh, a civilian president uh, told the US ambassador four days before that he was going to impose martial law. And uh, the Secretary of State, uh, John Foster Dulles, uh, crafted a very carefully worded uh, cable, uh, which uh, went back to say, yes, please tell him that we support democracy, et cetera, but uh, we are willing to live uh, with uh, deviation for a short period of time if it's necessary. So this became the kind of mantra and the kind of guiding force. Uh, then comes the 1965 uh, period when Pakistan and India went to war over Kashmir. And suddenly, Pakistan, which was totally dependent on US aid, found that all its aid was cut off. And so um, Pakistan had assumed that it would get United States help uh, when it got into a battle with India. But the US read that uh, agreement very differently. In 1971, things had changed a little bit because the Pakistanis had put pressure on the US to actually issue a letter saying that if there were, uh, Pakistan was attacked by any country, not just the communists, that the US would come to its aid. And so uh, we have this very interesting scene 
uh, with Henry Kissinger uh, in the White House briefing uh, President Nixon and saying that the people at state tell me that there's a piece of paper, but they're still looking for it. Um, so the point that I want to make is that uh, unless uh, you have a long-term historical view of the relationship, um, new uh, administrations will come into Washington and continue making the same old mistakes. Um, I, I illustrated this for our group uh, at, at the USIP uh, with, with just a very brief reference to, to how we look at time uh, in Pakistan. Uh, we have the word kal, which means yesterday and it means tomorrow. Uh, but it is, it's not bound by 24 hours. Tomorrow could be day <coughs> after tomorrow, next month, next year, or maybe never, inshallah, bukra. Uh, the same with the kals, uh, you, when you say kal, meaning the past, uh, it could be a decade, it could be a century. So. When you talk to people in Pakistan, particularly on the street, they remember the events of 1950s and the 60s and 70s as if they actually happened yesterday. And they have very fresh memories. And therefore, they're extremely unwilling to support any government that is willing to tie itself to the United States. So this brings us to the period that, that we were reviewing, 2003 and beyond, actually 2001, when President Musharraf, uh, who was all in all in Pakistan, without consulting anyone, on the basis of a completely concocted story that the United States was going to bomb uh, Pakistan back into the Stone Age, never happened. He, he, he made a decision and then told his core commanders that this is what he had heard that the US was going to do. And there was no proof that the United States had actually made that threat. Now, the relationship with Musharraf, um, exemplifies the kind of support that the United States gives rulers in the Islamic world. Uh, Dan had already mentioned the idea of, of autocrats. Uh, in Musharraf, the United States found a liberal autocrat. This was a man who talked of enlightened moderation, who talked about being Western-oriented, talked about being the Islamists, uh, against the Islamist uh, resurgence and militants, uh, a partner in the war on terror, and so on but a man who also was willing to make deals with the Islamic parties in order to get past the 17th Amendment <coughs> of Pakistan's constitution, which allowed him to assume superpowers, transform and basically hijack a parliamentary democracy into a presidential autocratic system. And the United States was silent. The people of Pakistan went along with that, but then when Musharraf had his self-inflicted wounds uh, in 2007 when he removed the Supreme Court Chief Justice and civil society coalesced around that movement, uh, the United States again remained silent. There was no talk about restoring the rule of law or restoring the Constitution. Uh, it just remained mum. And the people of Pakistan recall that and still remember that vividly. As a result, when elections were held, and the army, which is a very powerful player in Pakistan's political scene, decided that it would sit it out, that it would only ensure the security of elections, you found a remarkable turnaround. The Islamists got defeated. None of the Islamic parties really had any decent showing. And you had a return of the two most popular parties, both of whose leaders had been sent into exile, uh, Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and uh, Nawaz Sharif. Of course, Prime Minister Bhutto had been given a very warm US embrace before she went back. And so she arrived in the country as the quote unquote American candidate. And it was a death foretold. And it was a tragic event for Pakistan because it, it produced turmoil and that turmoil still persists. So against this background and this history, let me just quickly uh, share with you my suggestions. First of all, both the United States and Pakistan have to learn from this experience, from this history. Within Pakistan, and this is the critical part, the internal reform process, the political reform process must continue. And this means uh, ceding the powers of the center to the provinces so that you don't have the kind of uh, centrifugal forces that are created by the centralization of power in Islamabad. 
uh, you need to bring Balochistan, the Northwest Frontier Province, and Sindh along with the Punjab um, so that they're all in agreement on what kind of Pakistan uh, they want to, to be. The army has to withdraw to the barracks, and, and some of the, uh, the, the new signs from the new army chief, General Kayani, indicate that he wants to take the army back to the barracks and to convert it into a professional force again. But we've heard this particular uh, tune before, and things change, and as chaos ensues, and particularly when you have pressure on Pakistan from uh, the eastern border, as well as the uh, militancy and insurgency, which is staining uh, not just the, the federally administered tribal area, but also parts of the settled area, uh, you're likely to find people turning back to the army to give it some stability. That would be a step backward. An important thing to recognize, uh, and this is relevant to some of the discussion of the rest of the Muslim world, is that Pakistan somehow managed to temper the, the rise of Islamic militancy by allowing Islamic parties to actually participate in its political system. And I think this has created a rather interesting tension between the militants and the relatively moderate Islamic parties by making them part and parcel of the political process and giving them um, ownership. So the final lesson uh, for the United States really is uh, to recognize that whoever is elected in a democratic manner will get the United States support, that it's the people of Pakistan that the United States will have a relationship with and not any individual nor any party. And certainly not uh, to favor the military over the civil because protracted military rule has stunted uh, civilian institutions and the political system within Pakistan. So that's the bottom line, and I'm sure we'll have questions. I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Um, remarkably, we have a good, uh, a good 20 minutes for discussions. I and only thank the group for adhering so scrupulously. I feel almost a little guilty. Uh, perhaps that was too, too rough on you. You're the but, liberal uh, autocrat. <laughs> the liberal autocrat. I, I want to say that listening to the presentation, one of the things that comes, becomes clear is the extent of the absence of kind of long-term strategic thinking about the democracy promotion agenda in itself and the way this agenda was somehow invented on, uh, on the cuff. Uh, it is not an easy challenge for any administration to think long-term about this agenda, but it's absolutely critical that there be long-term uh, thinking, strat strategizing, and a kind of consistency which all, all three panel members have uh, reminded us has been absent in our approach to this question of democracy and democracy and security. I might also add very quickly that another project that we've had at USAP in tandem with the study group is a project looking at Arab political oppositions and particularly the relationship between um, Islamists and secularists uh, in the Middle East in particular. Uh, Arab autocracies, and to some extent we've seen aspects of this in Pakistan, are a kind of protection rackets which uh, offer, offer certain groups protection, particularly from Islamists, and the, the, the Islamist threat is exaggerated domestically as well as regionally, internationally, to make the case for sustaining autocracy. One way of undermining this process is to promote a, a real dialogue between Islamists and seculars by which they can discover co perhaps, hopefully, common interests and a common agenda. We have promoted that kind of a dialogue through meetings in Morocco and in Egypt as well. Anyway, um, I think we'll open up to discussions here. We, uh, you may want to have a, dis a question that is, is Focus on a particular case, or you may have a broader question. So, but please make your questions as succinct as possible. Uh, we'll start here and work our way back. One, the ambassador. Two, Tony. Three. Yes. Uh, my question is for Dr. Shahata. Microphone. Yes. Wait. We do have. Sorry. Uh, my question is for Dr. Shahata. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you focused on the central role of the Arab-Israeli conflict and opening space for the opposition in Egyptian politics. So, I was wondering if you could talk about the sort of point of view of the Egyptian opposition toward the conflict, particularly the Brotherhood, and maybe contrast that point of view with that of the regime, the position on the conflict. Thank you. 
I think yeah, you know. absolutely. Okay. Well, one of the interesting things, and the way I'll answer the question, which Corey could have asked me at any time at Georgetown, but that's okay. Well, I'll answer it here briefly. Um, one, one of the interesting things about um, the recent situation, actually, is I've been following the Egyptian opposition and particularly the Muslim Brotherhood's reactions to the Gaza conflict. And it's quite fascinating to look at the statements and the radicalization of the position taken by the Muslim Brotherhood from the very beginning of the Gaza conflict um, towards the end of December, as opposed to the position that not only the Muslim Brotherhood, but wide segments of the Egyptian public are taking now, uh, two weeks into the conflict. At the beginning of the conflict, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, as well as other groups, called for, there was a, quite a great deal of criticism, not only towards Israel and the United States, but also towards the Egyptian regime, of course, of not allowing uh, humanitarian and medical supplies into Gaza and restricting the passage into Rafah, and also because of President Mubarak's statement that the border crossing would not be opened um, until Fatah controlled the, the, either the border or the West Bank. What, so initially, the calls were, the statements were, for the immediate efforts of the Egypt as well as the Arab leaders to bring an end to the violence, an immediate cessation of the violence. There was criticism of Israel in the United States, and there was a call to open the border crossing for humanitarian and medical supplies. That contrasts quite significantly from the statement that I received yesterday directly from the Muslim Brotherhood as well as many other opposition groups in Egypt, including secular intellectuals, which called on the freezing of the Camp David Accords. In other words, the positions vary depending on what's going on on the ground. The Brotherhood's official position with regard to Israel has always been not to um, uh, tear up the Camp David Accord, but to uh, open it to a, a referendum that the Egyptian people should then decide. So their position is much more uh, reasonable than it has been characterized by many, um, by many observers, I think. And, and maybe I'll stop there for the moment. Uh, f first, uh, d despite uh, despite my disagreement with many things you have said, Mona, I fully agree with all your conclusions. Uh, at, at least you have offered a, a, a sophisticated, nuanced analysis of the situation in one particular Arab country. The big question is the following. I'm not sure if this should be addressed to Mona or to Samir. Um, um, uh, Mr. Bromberg, con contrary to what you said, Mr. Bromberg, sorry, contrary to what colleagues. you said, every, every internationally conducted opinion uh, uh, survey in the Arab world have indicated, indicated consistently in the past 10 years that the overwhelming majority of the Arab people hmm, would support the so-called policies of the policies of so-called rogue regimes and extremists. I mean, uh, uh, by, by, by the U.S. administration. Uh, 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 only th six months ago, the University of Maryland conducted a public opinion survey in six so-called moderate Arab countries. Morocco, this is so important, Morocco, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, United Arab Repub uh, Emirates, and Jordan, in which 92% of the people supported the Iranian position on nuclear uh, 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 technology, uh, uh, when they were asked who were their most respected Arab leader, number one came Hassan Nasrallah, number two came the president of the rogue state of Syria, number three came prince, uh, the prince of Dubai, which is an indicator that first and foremost they thought of the nationalistic causes, and then they thought of the good governance. But those were the three leaders that were elected as the most respected by the Egyptians, the Saudis, the Jordanians, the Moroccans, and the Lebanese. Hmm? This is so important. The question is the following. Anna <coughs> has just said that she expects in the forthcoming elections in Lebanon to have, uh, 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 probably, it's a, 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 a hypothesis, a government led by a coalition in which Hezbollah is the, the uh, largest partner. Uh, if we will see what, if if the United States will follow exactly the example 
uh, given by President Bush and impose sanctions on Lebanon immediately the very same day they elect such a government, just as it happened with Hamas, then what do we expect if the same happens in Egypt, in Algeria, in Morocco, in Syria? What, will we end up with a, 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 a whole variety of, of, of Arab uh, regimes under severe extreme sanctions by the United States of America? Or do you think this will be very different because we will have a different administration? It's on the uh, USIP reform and security team applauded or endorsed uh, American policy towards the Middle East with regard to this particular question. I certainly believe that democracy by its very nature produces unknown outcomes. And if you are a Democrat, you have, to, you have to accept the unknown outcomes as long as the basic institutions are in place that, that require and maintain the principles of democracy. And therefore, I certainly thought that the US was incredibly misguided in terms of uh, cutting off or isolating the Palestinians uh, after the January 26th elections, which were, by all international standards, free and fair. Uh, I would also say that it was a tremendous mistake, again, to reduce pressure on Egypt or to stop encouraging Egyptian reform, to be polite, uh, after the Muslim Brotherhood performed well in Egyptian elections in November and December 2005. I don't know if the disagreement is as maybe severe as it's made out to be. Yeah, and I would by just very quickly add to this. I'm not worried or surprised when I hear that the polls would show that Nasrallah is a hero. It just it just reminds us of the extent to which, and we've seen this in dealing with our Arab op oppositions project, the extent to which the, the the enduring nature of conflicts in the region, whether it's between Israel and Palestine, or more broadly speaking, between populist forces in the United States, sucks the oxygen out of the air and allows for more radical forces basically to to set the agenda. So this is one reason why it's important to, to address the security agenda in tandem with the, and the peace agenda in tandem with the reform agenda, the two together. Anyway, we, we only have about six minutes left. So I've got Tony and then our, the gentleman here, and I believe Andrew, uh, and then, uh, Trudy. Uh, sorry? Trudy, right. Trudy, yes, Trudy, did you have your hand up there? Okay, and, and we, we may have to call it quits at that point. Uh, we'll see how things go, uh, Tony. Yeah, very briefly, and this is already... Microphone. Yeah. My wife says my voice is loud enough to talk without a microphone, but I'll use it here. Um, I have a uh, hypothesis, and all of the panelists have really sort of touched on it or dealt with it without making it totally explicit, and then I have a very brief question. The hypothesis is anywhere that an honest, truly honest, truly democratic election is held today in the Arab world, and as Shuja, uh, Pakistan may be, not the Arab world, but it may be an exception to this, but anywhere in the Arab world, almost certainly Islamists of some form or another are going to either win or at least do very well. I'd like to have the uh, panel's reaction to that. But perhaps more importantly, my follow-on question is, if that is the case, should there not be in Washington some very careful reconsideration of what we're doing or not doing in engaging directly with Islamist movements that come in various hues and have disagreements within themselves uh, in other words, a fundamental, perhaps, rethinking of our sort of uh, long-standing now boycott of uh, talks with such movements. Well, I, I, I will only say that, uh, in many respects, the boycott of the Islamist movements is more the exception than the rule. If we look at a lot of the Arab states and we look at beyond the Arab world, we are engaging Islamists all the time, and Islamists are key players in a lot of our democracy promotion strategies. And often, when we look at this problem, it focuses on Egypt, and there we have a boycott. But it's not necessarily the case. But anyway, why don't I uh, turn it to my colleagues, and then I'm going to let the three other remaining question, uh, questioners put their questions, and then we'll just take them and wrap up, because we are under pressure to conclude. So please jump in. Just a two sec, you know, very brief response. I mean, first, I think it's unclear in cases where Islamists are not permitted to participate exactly how well they'll do. I mean, on some level, because they're not per permitted to participate, there may actually even be an exaggerated 
sense of how well they're do, they'll do. So let's put that out there first. But that being said, no doubt, for many reasons that perhaps you're familiar, um, Islamists do fairly well in open elections. And in a paper that I've wrote, I, I would argue that, yes, we need to very much rethink a policy of responding in a knee-jerk fashion uh, to all Islamist parties. I, I, you know, my word here is nuance. It's, a, it's essential to inject nuance and to understand that these parties are also capable of evolving. And I would submit to you that political participation uh, breeds some amount of evolution and moderation, and therefore it's our, in our long-term interests for them to be included in the political process. Understanding that we're talking by and large about moderate Islamist parties that eschew violence. The Lebanese and Palestinian cases are, I think, a bit different for many reasons, and I'll stop at that. I have been given the two-minute warning, so I, I'm, uh, and I, uh, I'm afraid that we're gonna have to uh, take these questions and then, uh, and then wrap up, so very quickly. Obviously, I'm gonna ignore the two-minute warning, go yes, on for four minutes. Okay. Please. Question for, sorry, okay. thank you. I have a question for, Shuja, in, in when the Afghans were fighting against uh, Soviet troops, and uh, they were their enemies, are occupying forces, and they were, but the Mujahideen, they were, Afghans were called Mujahideen. Now the Afghans are fighting against NATO troops, and now they are called terrorists, but they are the same Afghans. Can you draw some parallel, what is the difference here? And also from uh, my friend from Egypt, I will say that how far is the parliament relevant in, in Egypt and uh, if the recommendations he's making, if he takes his recommendations to uh, Hosni Mubarak, how he would respond to his recommendations? Andrew and, and, and uh, My question is, oh, it's sorry. okay, Trudy, go ahead. Uh, my question is to Shusha. Um, the United States is an 800 pound gorilla in Pakistan by virtue of enormous amounts of military aid and now proposed by still Senator Biden, uh, much more uh, non-economic aid. Do you think that those two parts of aid should or could be used to try to ensure that democratic government remains? Hi, um, my question is for Samer. Um, the US is pursuing peace between Israel and Syria at the moment to promote security. Uh, in the region, and at the same time has a policy of promoting, um, for lack of a better word, democratization or political liberalization or whatever. Samer, based on what happened in Egypt, how would a treaty likely affect political reform based on what we learned from Egypt, I mean, if you were to hypothesize, and what lessons can be learned so that we could possibly help achieve both? How would a treaty between Syria and, and Israel, Israel affect political reform? In uh, I'm going to give each of our, like, let's imagine this is a presidential <laughs> debate. Each of you has 30 seconds to answer. And we'll have to sure. I'm sorry. I'll, I will take uh, 30 <clears throat> seconds or less. Um, I think it wouldn't be unfair to characterize the Egyptian parliament, like many parliaments in the, uh, in, under authoritarian regimes, as being to largely rubber stamp institutions. In Egypt, we have an imperial presidency and a president who's been in power for 27 plus years. That being said, however, it has been remarkable to see certain political institutions which have a venerable and quite long history in Egypt, like the Supreme Constitutional Court, uh, make decisions that are democratic in nature and uphold the rule of law. Also, interestingly enough, those political movements in Egypt that are seeking in the most uh, energetic terms to make the parliament as an inst democratic institution relevant has been the Muslim Brotherhood. With regard to the question about what would Mubarak say, President Mubarak say to the recommendations, I think you know one of the first lessons of political science is that autocratic regimes do not give up power easily or willingly. <coughs> they did not put themselves out of business, you know, uh, themselves. And so there would be no question that I think many of the measures that I have put forward would be rejected. I don't think that's the point. The point is the vast majority of Egyptians have called for these positions which are basic and fundamental, I think, to the principles of good governance, transparency, accountability, and political participation. I'm, I'm gonna cede my 30 seconds oh to Shusha. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in response to Dr. Chaudhary, um, uh, this, is, this is a reflection of the transactional relationship that the United States has had 
um, this change in, in the stance vis-a-vis -vis the, the same people that once fought alongside the U.S. against the Soviets. Uh, but I would go to what Mona was suggesting, that there needs to be a nuanced approach in dealing with the, uh, even the militant Islamists. You can isolate the extreme militants by talking to uh, the less extreme ones and bring them on board. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, just yesterday when we were talking uh, uh, at the release of our FATA report at uh, CSIS, we talked about the Madrasa Reform Project. That's one way of engaging uh, the, the breeding grounds for this kind of potential militancy to, uh, to make people aware that you can have a much broader education and it'll help you rather than simply confining yourself to a very narrow band. In response to Trudy, uh, yes, I think the, the shift away from purely military uh, aid and, and aid uh, primarily for support of the Afghan initiative uh, is going to be very helpful because Biden Luger <laughs> is not solely confined to the border region. Uh, the most important part of that is that it will allow people in the rest of Pakistan over a long period of time. So this is uh, 10 years. So this is the Pakistani cull, uh, you know, in the future uh, at work. Uh, and, and when they see this long-term engagement uh, and uh, uh, economic development uh, taking place over the long run uh, with US help, uh, that's likely to, to have much uh, more effective results than uh, what's been happening in the past. Well, thank you very much. I've been asked to just to quickly mention that there's a meeting about to take place on Afghanistan, to which you're all invited right next door in the ballroom. Thanks very much for a very rich discussion in a very short amount of time. Oh, it's upstairs. Thank you very much.